Hello, my name is Van Mathis, and I appreciate the opportunity to relate my story of my experiences from the 9 11 uh, terrorist attacks in New York and Washington. Right now, I am Vice President of Operations at Marbury Creative Group, but on September 11, 2001, I was a major in the United States Air Force, having been assigned to the Pentagon two months earlier from an overseas tour in Korea. I don't know if you remember, uh, but September 11th, that day, along the eastern seaboard was a beautiful day, not a cloud in the sky. And I had departed home in Alexandria for uh, my works uh, section at the Pentagon, and I want to tell you that I, uh, when I was there at the Pentagon, where I sat in my desk had been physically relocated to a government lease building about two miles away uh, because we were had just started the renovation project for the Pentagon. Uh, tremendous uh, high, high cost uh, project, but some elements of the Pentagon were moved out. So where I sat every day to do emails and answer the phone was uh, on 1500 Wilson Boulevard in Roslyn, Virginia. I would take a bus to the Pentagon. But everything else I did as far as my job was in the Pentagon. My uh, organization was there. I worked for the Office of the Air Force Reserve uh, as a policy uh, manager, uh, even though I was on active duty. I had that staff job there. And my colleagues were, were there in the Pentagon. My boss was in the Pentagon. Everybody I worked with was in the Pentagon. So every day, normally, I spent half to three quarters of the day in the Pentagon. But this particular morning, as I metroed in, I realized I didn't have to stop at the Pentagon to see any of uh, anybody in my in my directorate, and I was going to go and check my emails and get started for the day. So I'm there uh, Tuesday uh, in the morning and sitting there, knocking out a few emails, and someone walks by my cubicle. It's cubicle country in the Pentagon, and said, "Hey, a plane just hit the World Trade Center in New York." And my first thought is, somebody flew a Cessna into the building, one of the aerial advertising planes that carry a banner. And I honestly didn't think about the level of magnitude of what I was going to see uh, later on. And so I continued to type a couple of emails, went to, uh, went to the break room, got a cup of coffee, came back, and another voice said, hey, let's go check this out on television. And as I am walking to the TV room, I heard this audible gasp. And as I walk in, I'm catching the last seconds of second fireball at the World Trade Center. Absolutely stunned. And then I see the other smoke, and I'm thinking that is definitely not the plane carrying uh, an aerial, aerial sign. Uh, then I'm thinking, as we were talking about it amongst ourselves, did a, did a commercial pilot have a heart attack? What, what happened? Was there an instrumentation failure that led to this occurring? We started to get some, some strange indications over in our building. We were getting phone calls from the Pentagon uh, alerting us to um, some evolving scenarios and threats. The news is starting to get out about the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And we occupied one of the highest buildings in, in Roslyn, uh, 15 stories. And we were getting uh, lots of calls from our directorate and other directorates who, who had offices, lease offices in that building. They said, we think that there is an absolute threat that this building will be targeted by, uh, by a hijacked airline. We started to get indications that there were numerous aircraft that were had been hijacked and were inbound to, to Washington, D.C. and other cities along the, the uh, eastern seaboard. So a very confused time, but this is the information that we were starting to receive. About 9.45, 9 or 10 o'clock, we started to get calls about something's happened at the Pentagon. <laughs> and they ran the gamut. We were, uh, of the people in my office, we were getting calls that said, a small plane has crashed into the Pentagon. No, a small plane did not crash into a Pentagon. 
but there was a, a, a suitcase bomb or a briefcase bomb that had gone off. And then, no, no, none of that happened. There was a bomb, but it was intercepted. So, again, a very, very confusing time. Then we started to get some calls from people in our directorate that were there and said, I think the building has been hit. I felt a, I felt a shudder, uh, just a deep-seated vibration. And then we started to piece together what had occurred at the Pentagon. As that was happening simultaneously, we were given orders in my location to evacuate the building because they were becoming more and more concerned, they being senior leadership, was becoming more and more concerned that in this building, we were going to be an easy target for a hijacked airliner. And I recall a two-star general coming down to our floor uh, as the senior ranking individual in the building and saying, we are going to evacuate uh, for force protection. We're gonna get out, get out of the building. So we left the building, lots of people in, in Air Force blue suits and, and other service suit uniforms. And we're standing out, uh, main, trying to maintain some, some order and some organization outside. And things are starting to grind to a halt at that point the cell phone network went out. No landlines were available. The subway, the metro, was hadn't been shut down at that particular moment, but there were lots of delays, obviously, for you know, what was happening at, at the Pentagon. I, mean, I just remember seeing this wave of people coming up Wilson Boulevard from the nearest metro station because the metro, uh, although not shut down yet, to, to our knowledge, a lot of the trains were delayed, obviously, with what was happening at the Pentagon and people were coming out of the, of the metro up up the street and just very upset, just crying. I could see a sense of shock and loss on people's faces as they were hearing the news. And I could, I could get a sense that people were angry as well. So as we are outside, everybody's looking around to see where are these inbound aircraft, are we gonna, or, or are there gonna be more impacts we're, we're hearing? Uh, news of what's happening in uh, in New York. I remember uh, someone uh, with the red pickup truck uh, had the windows rolled down, had the uh, had the, the radio turned way up, and there were just crowds of people uh, surrounding the, uh, the the truck, and we could just hear the accounts of there goes the, the first tower, the tower, the tower has collapsed, and the, the reaction of of the crowd was something I'll, I'll never forget. Just and as as the announcement is made, the, the tower is collapsing. Another gasp and crying and uh, a truly a, a horrific moment. So we continued to try and, and have uh, have some awareness of, of what was going on. Uh, then people started to ask us in uniform, "What's the military doing about this? What what's our response going to be?" Where do I enlist? I mean, actually got a few of those comments. Uh, and we tried our best to, to provide the information that we had uh, that we could give out in, in an accurate fashion uh, and not, not wanting to, uh, to misspeak in any capacity. Uh, the day wore on, we continued to listen to, uh, to the radio uh, as the intelligence reports came in. Uh, it was deemed safe that we could go back, to, uh, back into the building uh, where we started to get accountability of, uh, of our personnel, uh, started to have some emergency meetings on what the next steps are going to be. Uh, then we tried to make it home, uh, and it was, it was a, an absolute challenge. Interstates completely gridlocked. Uh, Metro had been shut down uh, for many hours, and I remember finally making it uh, home uh, to my wife uh, late in the evening. And what a wonderful sight to see uh, my wife uh, waiting on the on the porch uh, when I got home, and uh, the hug and the embrace that was just uh, it was just such a wonderful thing to, to receive after uh, that day. Uh, and the, knowing what was happening at the Pentagon, uh, knowing what was happening in New York, knowing the struggle uh, on the aircraft uh, uh, from the passengers trying to wrest control from the hijackers and the other airplanes, it just Totally, totally mind-boggling. And then that night, I remember hearing 
for the first time, and then I heard it every night for the next three years of my assignment, the start of uh, combat air patrol over Washington, D.C., as F-16s and F-15s from surrounding uh, Air Force bases, Bowling and Andrews, uh, were executing combat air patrol. They would take off and make a, make a slow turn over our neighborhood and continue uh, combat, air, combat air patrol all night. Uh, and just the, the roar of the, of the aircraft, and I thought, I, I've never, I've never experienced anything like this. And, uh, the the feeling of I can't believe this has happened on, on our own shore. Uh, next day, uh, we were back in business. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, my first uh, task for the next day was to go back into the Pentagon uh, to retrieve classified information and start the planning uh, to uh, mobilize the reserve component because that was going to be uh, that was going to be a priority which led into uh, uh, Operation Noble Eagle, the mobilization of the reserve component to protect for Homeland Security reasons. And I remember going into the Pentagon, still seeing a little smoke in the, in the corridors and the smell, the smell of the fire, uh, electrical fire, the smell of a, of, a, of a burned transformer. And they were still trying to put out some fires and they were still trying, uh, you know, trying to accomplish a search and recovery uh, mission at that point to to remove the fallen from from the Pentagon and uh, trying to shake off the, the, the sense of of a complete and utter surprise attack. Uh, we we tried to continue to, to focus uh, on our mission at hand and, and you know you start to realize uh, the, the thin margins that, that are in life. Um, this occurred on September 11th. Uh, on September 12th I was scheduled for an all-day meeting in the exact corridor where the aircraft impacted, and I have no doubt that in the span of another 24 hours, I would not be sitting here uh, to, to tell you the story. And for the next six months, uh, as we were executing our mission, uh, we would always try to you know, find someone, and if you found an acquaintance, you said, where were you? And Speaking of the thin margins in life, I, I remember running into a, an army officer that I had worked with in Korea in our previous assignments, and uh, he related the story of, well, I was along, I was, my office was in that hallway where the aircraft impacted, and he told the story of how he and his friend were watching everything unfold on uh, on television, and my acquaintance said, I just had to, I had to go to the bathroom, and he, he told his friend, I'll be right back. And in the intervening minutes where he went to the restroom and came back, the aircraft had impacted along that hallway and the friend he had been speaking with was killed. And so it's just a, a truly a, a, an unbelievable uh, moment in our history. Uh, subsequent to those attacks, uh, we launched several military operations, uh, Operation Enduring Freedom, which followed uh, soon after the attacks of 9-11, uh, and then subsequently Operation Iraqi Freedom, with which I was tasked to deploy to Baghdad in 2005 and 2006. So that is the, the culmination and the end results uh, for me uh, for the uh, events of 9-11. And I just want to thank everyone here at the city for allowing me to tell the story. It's so important that we continue to remember what occurred on that date uh, those that paid the ultimate price uh, on the ground and in the air, and also uh, just a tremendous, uh, a tremendous debt we owe our first responders and our, our members of our armed forces. And rest assured that the, the military and the armed forces and these first responders will continue to always have that mindset to execute the mission and protect this great country. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and take care.